Cowboy Way in Gene Autry, Oklahoma, with a legend, Mr. James Drury, and it's an honor to be sitting here with you, Mr. Drury. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, I got one question for you that I want to throw at you. Well, I'm not really a question. I just want to tell you. I want to tell you about the first time I knew who James Drury was. Okay. You were one of the Reno brothers. That's right. Elvis Presley's first picture. Love me tender. And we had a wonderful time with that show. And he was this young man. We didn't know who, had no idea who Elvis was. None of us knew. He, he had been on the Ed Sullivan show, you know, and all that. But we weren't really aware of that. So we said, who, who is Elvis? Well, we found out who Elvis was, you know. Uh, over the next 40, 50 years, we got a pretty good idea of who Elvis was. But yeah, was he great. came on there, and he was such an eager uh, earnest young man. He wanted to be very, very good in whatever he did. He was seeking perfection. He tried, wanted to know everything we knew about uh, freedom in front of the camera and how to how to relate uh, to motion picture acting. And we told him everything we possibly could. And he wanted to know how you learn your lines. And I told him, don't learn your lines. Learn your script. Right, learn the right. script from beginning to end. And he told other people that that's how he did it. So I was the first one that told him that because when I work, I read the play and learn the whole play, everybody's lines, every situation, even in scenes I'm not in. Otherwise, how are you going to know what the story is? So that's what I... What, what he left, uh, got for me. Yeah, and I that was, picture had some great actors in it. Richard Egan, oh, Dick yeah. Padgett, Bonnet. That, it was a wonderful, wonderful cast. And oh, let me say, uh, William Campbell. Yeah, he was great. <laughs> and I think, uh, I think that was one of the best pictures Elvis ever made. I made a lot of pictures, but most of them were very sketchy on the script, you know, yeah. and they did, spent a few dollars on the script and the rest of the cast and gave Elvis his million-dollar salary or whatever he was getting at that time, uh -huh. which was at least a million. Yeah. And... Uh, he went on with it, but they weren't. This was a planned motion picture with a well written script and a well developed story, and he did well with it. He did didn't. you see Elvis any time after that? Oh, many times. Many times. Many times. I would go to a town where he was appearing. Uh -huh. I'd go to the show, buy a ticket, and within five minutes, he'd know I was in the show and or in the audience, and he'd send one of his guys out to come get me, and I'd go backstage with him, and we'd, we'd hang out all night you know mm -hmm. so I, I saw him many in many different venues many around the country well the one thing that i liked about that movie personally was the family unit that oh, was yeah. there between you all of y'all well it, it it rang true it it had the ring of truth to it and uh, and it and all the the tragedy of the the ending of it was almost foreordained foreordained you know we you kind of see it coming, uh, but no one knew when we got back to the Civil War that all this romance had started between Elvis and, the, and Deborah Padgett. So that came as a big shock to Richard Egan and to all the rest of us. So that was the way it worked out. But we sure enjoyed it. I of. really enjoyed the uh, the the part where. Y'all were all on the porch, and everybody was singing. He was singing, and y'all were clapping along with him. Yeah, well, I was probably clapping wrong. <laughs> uh, I can't sing. I can't carry a tune in a wheelbarrow. Well, don't feel bad. Neither can I. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I was talking to one of the guys from the Sons of the Pioneers in the early days of the Virginian. I had the chance to do a big, uh, big show in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and one in St. Louis. They were circuses, police circuses, that benefited the police force or the police retirement fund or whatever. 
And uh, we always said the Sons of the Pioneers is a musical act that I took in there. And they would always look at me and say, please don't sing, Jim. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't sing. Just don't sing. Mouth the words if you want to, but don't sing. So we were in Harrisburg, and I'd, I'd been instructed not to sing. But the, our closing number that I did with two other musicians was, This Land is Your Land, This Land is My Land. I thought, well, hell, I can clap. So I clapped, and 12,000 people are clapping. The Virginian can do no wrong. So I'm clapping like they're this. Clapping with you. And they're clapping with me, and they're wrong. They're off the beat. So I went over to my dad and come out from, my dad was a professor at New York University, and he'd taken the train out there to see the show. And I went by his table at the party afterwards, and I said, well, Dad, how'd you like the show? He said it was wonderful, Jimmy. It was just wonderful. But somebody ought to teach you something about music. I said, well, Dad, you know I can't sing. I've never been able to sing. He said, yeah, but my God, you can't even clap. <laughs> the, I, the one thing, uh, the one thing I, I think a lot of people would like to know, the, the ones who haven't heard you on an interview might want to know how you wound it up getting the part that you have become so well known for. Well, I had to, I had to do a screen test for it. And their only comment was, you're too fat, go lose some weight. So I went and worked out for about two weeks and went back and did another screen test. They said, you're too fat, go lose some weight. So I went back for another couple of weeks, and in 30 days, I lost 30 pounds. And I did a third screen test, and they didn't say anything except a week later, well, you're going to play the role. I got the, got the word on the Friday night before the Monday morning we started to shoot. And then nine years later, we were done. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a great run, though. That was a great run. A great, well, you were in a great company time. with uh, Jerry Cooper played, I think, the first Virginia, and then Joel McCray. That's and right. I guess you were next, and then there have been so many after you. Well, they, Bill Pullman did one, which I had a bit part in, and uh, I think uh, Tra Trace Atkins did one. I never, never found out what happened to that. I haven't seen it or no, it's ever been released or not? But I don't know. They but, made one with the Ron Perlman. To me, you are the Virginian. Well, uh, Dustin Farnham and William S. Hart both made silent versions okay. of it, and they both played it on the stage. It was uh -huh. a big hit on Broadway in 1903. They came out with the Virginian as a stage play, and it was a big success. And then they toured the country with it, and so it's it's been. Very, very instrumental and important to a lot of actors oh, yeah. that have played the role. The novel by Owen Wister, which I've never read, and that's, that's kind of sad because I read most everything. Well, I had read that in high school, and uh, I loved the story, but, of course, we, we just kept the characters' right. names. We changed their personalities a lot because we had to have three leading men. So we changed Steve from a cattle rustler to a leading man, and we changed Travis from a gunslinger to a re leading man. Mm -hmm. Because we had to have that continuity, so. Well, I know you've got to get back to your fans, and they're yes, waiting sir. for you out there. Yes, it's sir. It's been a real pleasure my and pleasure. an honor. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for having me. I, I'm honored. Oh, I'm my honored God. to I'm be honored. here. I'm always honored All to talk right. to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Virginian. Thanks so much, folks. I'm Colin Ray. Within the next 30 seconds, at least three children will be physically or sexually abused. We must stop this national tragedy that robs our children of their innocence, their dignity, and often their lives. If you or someone you know are being abused, call Child Help USA National Child Abuse Hotline at 1-800-4-A-CHILD. The call is free and confidential 24 hours a day. 1-800-4-A-CHILD. You can stop child abuse. We're back here at the Cowboy Way in Gene Autry, Oklahoma, and guess who we got with us now? Tell us, Jim. Oh man, we got we got one of my favorite actors, man, uh, Arthur Red Cloud. <laughs> and the man, the man, the man uh, is in this great movie. Tell me his name again. What the name of the, that great star that you work with? Oh, Mr. DiCaprio. Mr. You know, said Mr. No one calls me Mister. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, no, no. I'm looking forward to seeing the movie. A friend of mine gave it to me for a birthday present. Uh, you haven't seen it yet? No, I have not because I haven't 
been to a movie in a couple of years. Oh, yeah. I saw it. I, I liked it. I liked it very much. Boy, it looked like you were cold. <laughs> very much. Yeah. It, it was very cold when y'all filmed that, right? Very much. Yes. Yeah. And so. Was that in Calgary? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, and so. But you told me before that the gentleman who was the star, he actually got out in the, in the wilderness and lived in it with y'all, and everybody really got into the moment, right? Yes. And that was had to be an experience. Oh, yeah. Uh, but had, before, you was like a truck driver, right, before they picked you up for this movie? Yes. And then after that movie, you became a star, because I saw you at the Academy Awards. <laughs> Last time you saw me, that was right before I went, yes. But, uh, uh, yeah, they took me all the way out to the yeah. Academy Awards. I think what was what kind of experience was that? How did, how did you like that? Um, more like a red, you know, kind of like the Red Sea party and thing. It was uh, phenomenal and kind of surreal at the same time. So uh, it's quite um, intriguing, but also more uh, breathtaking at the same time. So now that you <coughs> are... <coughs> Working on Longmire. Yes, sir. Uh, is this, uh, how's your part? What kind of part do you have? Uh, I'm just one of the, um, for this scene, they have me uh, play one of the officers Okay. in the scene, so. Yeah. So, uh, and what, and what, again, what is Lou Diamond Phillips' role in this movie? Is he like a, a bartender or owns a bar or something? Yes. Yeah. He owns a bar and he has a bartender, yes. Yeah. And forgive me, I can't ever remember the name of the guy who's the lead actor. What's his name? His name is Zal McLaren. He is wonderful. Yes, sir. Yeah. He, is. he sort of reminds me, and, and I hope he takes this kindly if he ever sees this interview. He reminds me a lot of Robert Fuller. And he, he, same quality actor. And, and Bob Fuller, I respect highly. Yeah. And uh, same quality of actor that Bob is. And and, uh, and I mean that with the highest feeling. I, th I think he's wonderful. How many uh, seasons is that run? I, I, I watched the whole first season, but I hadn't seen another one since. I think it's about, uh, it's reaching its sixth season. So. That's, that's a good run. Pretty much for TV, yes. Yeah. Television and so, you get, did you tell me that you're having to go back? To do some more work? Yes. I leave on Monday to go back to do another scene with them. So um, I've been asked to come back and do a scene with them. So I'm quite intrigued and humbled and excited to go do it. So Yeah. And they, sh they shoot that in New Mexico, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the, your part is big on this. Is it a big part? Uh, it, I'm in there. I'm not big as I was. In, oh, what? No. With, you know, no. but uh, uh, I've got a small part. But so. you're. But you're working and you're acting. And, yes. And so is there something else coming up in the future that we can do? Um, I just got back from L.A. about a couple of weeks ago, and I did a uh, project with uh, James Franco. Um, and it's a project that he uh, contracted that he's been doing for the last five or six years with the uh, uh, USC school, uh, SAG, as well as uh, Fox Studios. And um, the... Uh, the uh, students that I work with are all grads or undergrads of USC, which is, of course, if you, if you know films, is the best film school in the world. Yeah. Um, with Steven Spielberg and George Lucas and other big, huge uh, film stars uh, dedicate and um, treat to that school for um, top priority of directors and producers and, you know, that come out of that, that uh, university. So um, he had contracted... Uh, for a film called Thomasina Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, which um, is one of the many projects that he has worked on and he's asked me to be on. So um, he brought me in into L.A. and I worked on that project for a good two to three months. And um, I just got back two weeks ago. And um, it's a, more of a film to uh, empower women um, that he has uh, produced because a lot of his films in the past have been more regulated as far as dark or dark funny or whatever. But, you know, with his, I think he's kind of taken a turn for this. Um, when I met him, there was, he was already doing two other projects at the same time. Um, he was doing a, a project called Disaster, which was uh, really making a lot of good um, 
recommendations, a lot of good uh, media attention for um, independent films at the uh, South by Southwest, and I think it even went to Toronto. So he's been quite busy, and um, I think just out of his heart, he did a project with the uh, East LA School um, project, film project called Dumpster Dive. So, um, I mean, he's just been really, really busy, but uh, very generous at the same time, very, um, very very articulate and very um, artist kind of guy to um, do something uh, very in intensive as well as um, teaching for a, a big project like that with, with a lot of people involved. So um, those 10 students from the USC school have or were or are um, directing 10 of those scenes in those in those big uh, in that big huge um, production along with the Lone Ventini uh, production is another um, investor that uh, into his film project so um, now with the uh, um, with the project being over it's going to take quite some time to get through with editing and all that whatever um, and whatnot and then hopefully it should be out within a year but um, God knows exactly what's going to happen next because um, now that uh, he has um, it has some open doors to either go motion picture as well as do well in the uh, independent films. But um, with my part that I, I had uh, put on, I went ahead and, um, as as you know, with with passion in, into um, into um, this role, but also to this character, I um, have the director um, asked me to rewrite the uh, Indian Joe part in this Huckleberry Finn. So. I've changed a lot with just the character alone to man a few words and very uh, a dark guy, kind of almost like the uh, villain, if you will, but also um, a, um, a gambler at the same time yeah. of life, not of money. But uh, he um, took a whole new turn for uh, as you know, as he crossed these two uh, actresses that I got to meet and work with, who are fairly new but are very, very talented um, on this project. So, um, and they were only 12 years old, but very, very professional, very, very, um, very articulate with their with their acting and stuff. So, um, I went ahead and rewrote Joe um, to quite um, almost a, a, a true. Um, Native American warrior, if you will. So mm -hmm. um, by that, it turned into something really great. So, you know, we'll see what happens within a year. But uh, um, I was uh, blessed and humbled to work with the 10 of the best uh, directors at the USC uh, University who are graduating. I'll be going back um, next week on Tuesday after I get done with Longmire to go see them graduate because all those 10 scenes were all done by graduates and undergraduates to graduate from that program. So um, it's just been a remarkable uh, journey to be on with James Franco and, and the project and the production or whatever it is and then um, have um, these other um, – you know, uh, TV um, roles come come about too as well. He's grown a lot since Spider Man, hasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And well, I'll tell you what. The, the one movie that knocked my life out was when he played the role of James Dean in the movie James Dean and did an uh, excellent job. And he, um, there were so many good actors in that movie. Jim's a big fan of James Dean. Yes, I am. In case you didn't notice, uh, I, I got that. Uh, uh, James Dean and uh, James Dean. And Steve McQueen, that was my man. They're my partners. I, I mean, I really admired him. But anyway, we want to thank you for being here. Oh, thank, thank you, you really for your time. Here. And uh, thank you, Dean, for helping out. Sounds like you're doing some really exciting stuff. It's, he's growing. He's really growing. Growing as an actor and doing great work. And uh, you, you see Franco, tell him that I'm a big fan. I sure will. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you on the big screen and the small screen. Yeah, both of them. Longmire. And we're going to say uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, thank Mr. Ray Cloud. And uh, th thank Mr. Ray. Oh, who are you again? Dean Redding. And uh, just kidding, folks. Anyway, thank you very much. And uh, we'll be right back. Don't do it. Don't throw away your baby. Don't throw away your life. A Texas law called Baby Moses allows you to turn your baby over at a fire station or a hospital safe baby site with no questions asked. You walk away. It's a choice for you and a chance for your baby. Save your baby's life. Save your own life. Look for the yellow safe baby sign.
we're back here at the Cowboy Way in Gene Autry, Oklahoma, with a great fella, Mr. Alex Cord. Hello. Good to have you here, Alex. It really is. Thank you, Dean. I'm happy to be here. You know, I saw you last year, but I remember the first time I ever met you, they were doing a, a, a reading, a Screen Actors Guild reading of your script, A Feather in the Rain. And I really enjoyed that uh, script. You're a good writer as well as a good actor. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I really I really enjoyed your, your writings and your acting. Well, it, it's a God-given gift for which I am extremely grateful. But uh, I don't, I'm not uh, falsely immodest about it. Uh, no, I'm not falsely modest about it. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm a really good writer. I think you are too. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about this book. We've got a book sitting on the table. Here. Yeah. And that, is this your latest? Yes, it is. Well, uh, yes, it is. Okay. Tell yeah. us about it. It's uh, a memoir. It's an autobiography. I've led an extraordinary life. I mean, I've often, I like telling stories and I've told stories about my life. And often, I, as I finish, I'm thinking, did that really happen or am I making this all up? I mean, it's extraordinary the things that have happened to me in my life. So I finally uh, have been being pushed by my agent to write a memoir. And I never, you know, was motivated enough until I realized the truth in the phrase that life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. So I realized that if I was ever going to write this memoir, now is the time. So I sat down, and this is the end product of about a year and a half's work. Well, tell us a little about what's, oh, just a few things that's in the book that, that our, our viewers would be interested in. Well, for instance, uh, they're all like separate little episodes. So you can pick it up anywhere, read it, and put it down, and you don't miss anything in terms of continuity. Uh, but I, I, I've known so many famous people and had great relationships with Kirk Douglas, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, Muhammad Ali. I can tell you a little story about Muhammad Ali. His wife, uh, as you know, I'm a serious horseman, and I kept horses for years at the L.A. Equestrian Center in Burbank, California. I was playing polo then. And uh, uh, Muhammad Ali's wife showed horses, uh, jumping horses. So he would often come to the shows that she was competing in. So I'd see him around there, and of course he was friends with the owner of the uh, equestrian center, as I was. Mm -hmm. And so one night they had a dinner, and uh, they invited me and Mohammed to be at the same table. And it was only a few people, it was about, uh, I think maybe eight people. And I sat next to him. And we got to be really friendly. I mean, we just hit it off. We liked each other. And he was such a unique individual. He had the charisma that we're all aware of. But he was really a big kid at heart. He was like a little boy. And he loved attention. And he loved entertaining people. And it turned out that he had been practicing magic. So he had a couple of tricks that he wanted to show us. And one of them was he would take a, you know, the, you've seen magicians with a flimsy scarf, you know, and it looks like a huge thing, but they can 
ball it up into nothing. It's so thin. So he whips out this scarf and does a flourish with him. I don't want to knock that. But I mean, it's a big, like that, you know, gesture. And the scarf is flying. And then he takes and uh, starts to uh, ball it up. And he takes his hand like this and does that. And then he takes the scarf in this hand and starts to stuff it down in there with his thumb. And he's stuffing away until he gets the entire scarf in there, this blown scarf. It's gone. You can't see it. It's not in this hand. And then he goes like that, and the scarf is gone. And you did just see him stuff it in that hand. And it was well done. I mean, it was very believable. And then he just accepted the applause and everything. And after uh, everybody was in awe of it, I finally figured out what he had done. I don't know how it came to me, but what it was was he had over his right thumb a rubber thumb, a fake thumb, so that when he first did that, he stuffed that rubber thumb down in there. It's now in there. Uh -huh. So when he puts the scarf in, he's stuffing it into that rubber thumb. And then when he finishes, he pulls it out, and he's got the thumb on, and the scarf is in there. And you can't tell because, obviously. And that was it. So I... At one point, I waited until everything had quieted down, and it was alone. And we, 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 I just had him by himself, and I said, "Muhammad Ali, I know how you did that." <laughs> he said, oh. and I told him, and of course, I was right. So I said, but "Where did you find a black rubber thumb?" <laughs> <laughs> he said, in a magic store. He said, they have them. I said, you know, you think they only have white magic or something? You know. But he was like a big kid. He just loved entertaining. And he was, that was so charming about him. And he was a gentle man. I mean, when you think about him and, you know, what a great fighter he was. In his soul, he was a kind-hearted, gentle man. And I'll never forget that about him, because after that, I spent a lot of time with him. I had lunches with him, because he would come there while his wife was riding horses. So that was that's in the book. But it's just one of many great privileges that I've had in my life. That's great. Wanted to bring, I wanted to bring up to you, I was sitting home one day watching Walker, Texas Ranger, and I saw an episode that you were in where you were on an all rig, remember that? And I watched that show and it was excellent. I mean, the, the technical in the, from everything, the story, the whole thing, and I, and I have to apologize, I wanted to, I asked him while ago and we couldn't remember the young man's name. But he was in that episode. I kept thinking he was the bad guy. And it was Patrick Swayze's brother. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good guy. He was a bit of a maniac. Uh, he did, uh, what do you call it, high diving off buildings with parachute. You know, we were... Oh, in real life? Yeah, that's what he did as a hobby. He It was illegal most of the time. He'd go into downtown L.A., climb to the top of a building, and jump off. Yeah. Mm. Wow. I also heard a in an interview you did. It was a radio interview, and I hope you don't mind telling this story. But I thought it was a cute story. The lunch with Elvis. Oh yeah, lunch with Elvis. You know. Yeah, people say 
Did you ever meet Elvis? Did I meet Elvis? I had lunch with Elvis, and I did. I had done this movie called Cinnamon, which was about drug addicts, and it was a very good film. A very good film. A little black and white movie. It had Edmund O'Brien was in it, Eartha Kitt, uh, a bunch of, oh, uh, let's see, I, I'm losing his name now, but another well-known character actor. And uh, this film, it was my first film, and it got great reviews. I, it made me a star overnight basically. And Elvis and his guy, no, so we were on the set. It was at MGM and I was doing a little detective movie there. And this guy appears and introduces himself and he says, I'm Joe Esposito mm -hmm. and I work with Elvis. And I knew that Elvis was doing a movie on another uh, sound stage. Everybody knew it. Uh, and he said, we ran your movie Synanon the other night at Elvis's house and loved it. And Elvis would like to invite you to have lunch on the set. So I said, when? He said, today if you can. I said, sounds good to me. I think I could make it. <laughs> so I went to the set at the appropriate time, and uh, uh, Joe came and escorted me uh, over there and stuff, and uh, went into his trailer, which was on the sound stage, and it was a really nice trailer, well, very well appointed and stuff, and um, I get in there, and it's just Elvis. Joe, myself, and uh, two other guys. They were his crew, you know. And lunch was catered, came in with uh, everything you could ever dream of. And we sat there for a good hour and had lunch and talked about drug addicts, about drugs, about cars about guns. It was just, you know, four guys. Uh, like you would, four guys would talk about women. And uh, that was my lunch with Elvis. Uh, yeah. What a great story. It was yeah. a great well, I'm going to tell you what. Uh, we want to thank you for taking time to come over here and share some of your stories. Where can you get this book? Amazon. All you have to do is go to Amazon, type in Alex Cord Books, and they'll come up. All right. Well, we know all your fans are still waiting out there to, to visit with you, and we do appreciate you coming by. Really, really <laughs> Thank enjoyed you. it. Thank you for taking this time to be with us, Mr. Cord. My pleasure, as always. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, my friend. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Alex. All right. All right. Thank you very much. But what we did is we took the third movement of the Grand Canyon Suite, Verdi Grofe's American classical piece for symphony from the 1930s, and the third movement is a very familiar melody on the trail, which inspired Dale Evans' first few notes of Happy Trails. The heart of the melody did this, and we did this song in honor of Dale, but also as, a, as difficult as we could put it together, so yeah. let's have fun with this. From On the Trail. This will be our last song for the duet, and then we'll have Kristen come up and do yeah. good stuff. If I mess up, don't hit me or kick me. <laughs> I hope not. You're going to be stubborn like a mule? Yeah. Yeehaw! 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 Mule! He's the stubbornest mule I ever saw. He's tossing his head. He's raising on lead. He's getting me all of a Twitter. That honorary critter he goes. Yeehaw! Yeehaw! He must have been born in Arkansas. Don't wanna be led, just wants to be fed. Why he make a fiddle play liberty, 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 go? Hee haw, hee haw. He's hankering for a pitchfork, a straw. His hoopies are beating and telling him soon to be eating his bed. Clipperty, clopperty, clopperty.
clippity clippity clop, clippity 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 clop, clippity clippity over the rim of the hill. We're on the trail. The sun is low, the canyon is wide. I Till we meet again, good luck, God bless, and we'll see you at the crossroads. Let's go, Dan.